Let's get ready to talk sports, entertainment, and innovation. It's time for C Con Shorts. Welcome to episode eight of Seacon Shorts. Excited to be here today with Kevin K, president of Entertainment Sponsorship Group. I'm Adam Honig. I'll be your host for today. Thank you for joining us, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you for joining Seacon Shorts. It's great to Adam. see you. Today. Thanks for the opportunity. Truly appreciate it. We're excited about this episode and to dive into you know more of the entertainment side. Seacon's not just a sports conference and event. It's sports, entertainment, innovation. So today we're going to get down with more of the entertainment innovation side with Kevin. So Kevin, tell us about yourself a little bit. I hear you're a Buffalo native, so definitely love that from our uh, our Syracuse Central New York uh, roots going up to Western New York. But yeah, talk to us about your, kind of your upbringing and where, where you're from and what you're all about. Yeah, I'm from Buffalo, New York originally and um, grew up in quite the... Um, music centric little neighborhood on the east side of buffalo corey wells a lead singer of three dog night lived down the street from me uh johnny resnick from the goose lived a block and a half over and rick james lived five blocks over the other way so my little area um was quite influential for me of course you know i knew what corey was doing of course johnny and i are about the same age and rick was doing what he was doing so it was exciting so i played in a number of bands you know just like everybody else tried to get signed and made the decision that that wasn't going to happen and decided to use my education. I was going to go to law school, become an entertainment attorney. Didn't want to, didn't want to do that. Didn't think it was for me. Became a paralegal, um, worked as, you know, at a number of different law firms, saw that, yeah, law firms weren't for me and decided to go back to school, got my degree in music entertainment management and lost, launched my uh, music business career, um, starting at Chrysalis Records. I spent a couple of years uh, there as an assistant, came back to Buffalo. I was in Atlanta at the time, came back to Buffalo when um, that kind of opportunity went away for me, started working as a booking agent and got a job as a paralegal during the day, doing some entertainment law work. Started booking the Google Goo Dolls, actually, crazy as that sounds, I became uh, one of their booking agents for a while. But then I got a call from Polydor Records, um, the individual that I had worked for at Chrysalis, went to Polydor, and she hired me to be the regional director of marketing and promotion for Polydor, and they moved me off to Houston. So I spent three and a half years in Houston. Um, we kind of went through a, a number of changes with with. Polygram. We were a Polydor, then we became the Polygram, uh, Polygram Label Group, um, which was kind of the first um, wave of a number of different labels coming together. Actually, we had seven labels under the group, each with its own functions within A&R and its business, but we consolidated marketing and promotion um, to encompass working all the labels. So it, it got a little crazy there. And then, you know, uh, Polygram bought Island Records, and then we became Island Records. Um, so I spent uh, all the way to 97 um, with Island Records. And in the meantime, I got promoted and moved to Detroit um, after my time in Houston. So and then once uh, I had an opportunity then to go to V2 Records with Richard Branson and started that helped start that label up from the beginning. So I had that opportunity, which was really great experience and really appreciate the opportunity to to be in on the ground floor of something you know new um at the time his non-compete was over after he sold virgin records and v2 is the label that he started so i spent about a, a year and a half there but then i got called back to polygram mercury records called me and said hey come back home to where you've been your whole life and i said okay so i went back um, but then I got caught up in the wave of the very first merger when Universal bought Polygram and sadly myself and hundreds of other people lost their opportunity and their job. But quickly I was uh, scooped up by DreamWorks Records and had an opportunity to go to DreamWorks and be there from the very beginning, which was probably my um, most favorite place to be just from an artist development standpoint because we were a label that was focused on signing only new artists. We were not going to sign any heritage or na big name artist, even though everybody 
Mo Mo Austin and Lenny Wanaka were running DreamWorks, and everybody from Reprise and Warner Brothers wanted to go there just because they love Lenny and Mo and wanted to be with them. But they said, "No, we're just going to build new acts." And that three and a half years was great, and that's really where I started to get into brand sponsorships. Um, I developed a division for DreamWorks at the time. Um, and really believed in these types of partnerships and especially in the music industry, because it really wasn't happening then. Sports, of course, as you know, um, you know, has exploded and has always been down the road of brand partnerships, generating revenue and, and furthering their marketing platforms, working with these brands, but music really wasn't doing it. Um, you know, nobody wanted to quote unquote sell out you know, especially the artist. And I remember having conversations with our artists at DreamWorks at the time, and they kind of gave me the same thing. But my response was, you already sold out, you signed a contract with a major corporation, a record company. So really, let's think about how we can do this. So when DreamWorks decided to sell, um, I decided to start the entertainment sponsorship group and brought DreamWorks aboard as my first client. So that's how I launched this um, company did that for a couple of years, but then Virgin Records called and liked what I was doing in the brand partnership world and thought I could be a hybrid for them because they wanted to kind of go down that road. At the same time, become the regional director of marketing um, within the Midwest. So I accepted that opportunity, spent three years there until that merger happened and Capitol Records took over and many people at Virgin were were let go. And at that time, I was like, pretty much done with the music industry. I just felt that it was too volatile to kind of keep going through mergers. Um, so I went into the agency side and was lucky enough to get a job with Jack Morton worldwide and started helping and managing different music projects for General Motors and Clearwater Communications, <clears throat> which was really, really interesting. And it was an, a, an opportunity to take all of my experience from brand and entertainment, from the music side, use my legal background, my marketing background, and, and kind of work um, everything together as one. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, from there, I went, um, well, unfortunately, the auto industry took a such a big tank here in Detroit. And <clears throat> I was let go along with so many other people that day when everything came crashing down. And at that point, I thought, well, maybe it's time to move out of Detroit. We're not from here. Decided Nashville was a place that would make sense. And I wasn't necessarily looking to get back into the music industry at the time. I just felt that Nashville is a progressive city, especially for marketing and advertising, brands and entertainment that I could possibly find my way just like I did at Jack Morton. But lo and behold, an opportunity came in Sony Music Nashville to start up their brand partnership division. And I accepted that position. Did that for a year and a half and merger number three that I go through happens when Sony decided to downsize on that fateful day. I think there were 600 people let go between Nashville, New York, and LA. Moved back to Detroit. Um, I, my family stayed here. They did not move down to Nashville with me. So we, we did the long distance because I did not know if that position at Sony was going to be there. Just the volatility. I want to make sure that this was really real. And so I'm kind of glad that I didn't move everybody down because it quickly well, went away. I came back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, you know, it, I understood going in what it could be and especially being a new position, a division that, you know, they really didn't totally understand the power of brand partnership. So there was a, a big learning curve, a lot of question marks at the time. So I come back here and get a job with a production company running their sponsorship division for the festivals that they put on. Did that for three and a half years and then kind of pivoted a little bit and um, went into teaching. And I was chosen to be the chair of the music business and entrepreneurship department here at the Detroit Institute of Music Education. Did that for three years as well as being an adjunct professor and really enjoyed my time teaching. I almost think that I might have missed my calling not being a teacher. Um, so I did that um, for three years, but kind of got to a point where I could see that the college was going in a different direction than what I believed and what I wanted to do. So I left that and crazy as it sounds, I jumped into the food industry. And um, 
with Tomo Milicevic, who is the guitar player for 30 Seconds to Mars, who I you yeah. know, formed a great relationship with when, during my time at Virgin. Um, Tomo's from Detroit. He wanted to start companies to kind of give back and start to create jobs. And a lot of people don't know, but Tomo is a chef. And so when it comes to the food industry, yeah. it, it was always a big passion of his. And, you know, we did a master class with him at the, at the college and we got together for lunch the next day. And he just said, Hey, look, I'm looking to start these companies. I need somebody who I can trust, somebody who's smart, who's going to be here because I'm still in Los Angeles. I am going back and forth, but we're touring around the world. I need somebody here to help us launch this. What do you think? And I said to him, well, I don't know anything about the food industry, but I'm willing to learn and, you know, took on that challenge and did that for three years. And when that kind of came to a close, I went back to the entertainment sponsorship group and and kind of went back into doing that, but kind of pivoted, decided to start consulting and coaching. Um, I didn't want to take on just a handful of clients because I wanted to be able to teach and reach more people and especially focus on the independent music community, which I really believe is a skill set that needs to be learned, not only by artists, but managers, booking agents, venue owners, festival producers, event producers. In order, in order for me to help more people, I needed to become more of a, co a coach and a consultant. Um, so I did that and, and then got a little bit of cra a little crazy and decided to start an artist management company at, at the same time. So dove into that and kind of doing that now, not working specifically with any specific artist right now, um, more consulting and more coaching because I'm able to reach more, more independent artists. So here we sit and had a great talk, you know, with Sean last year, he, you know, invited me to speak at the conference and he just felt that, you know, with my teaching background and education being, you know, an important foundation for everything that I do, he invited me and here I sit today, um, getting ready for the conference and especially now with our, our panel at Detroit uh, Music Collective, which is a new initiative that uh we're spearheading here i love it no kevin that's that's impressive i mean your background from teaching to consulting uh to music to food you've got a very diverse uh skill set and we definitely look forward to having you moderate uh this detroit collect music collective panel uh at secon here in july it's going to take place on july 17th at 205 p.m at, at virgin hotels and in las vegas uh speaking of secon kevin Talk to us about why you're so excited about Seacon, really the why. Well, you know, when Sean first reached out to me and we had the conversation, he was explaining what this was going to be. And I thought, you know, what a brilliant conference because education being the foundation of everything that this conference is about and really, you know, spoke to me. And when he and I had our first conversations and, and Sean and I first met when I was at Sony Music Nashville, we tried to get some brand partnerships and initiatives together with what he was doing. And I was, you know, always thankful that he and I stayed in touch. So when he reached out to me and said, hey, I think you'd be great to be a speaker, you know, in regards to sponsorships and brand partnerships. And uh, I accepted right away. Funny, though, that, you know, a couple months ago, as we had uh, further conversations as to what the conference was going to be, because he's been, you know, um, having I've been part of the music uh, leadership team in regards to kind of help formulate, you know, the music part of the conference. And when it came to some of the sessions, um, I had told him about the Detroit Music Collective, which is something that really we kind of started in December. And when I told him about it, he was just so excited and floored. He said, what if I gave you your own panel on this to talk about exactly what you guys are going to be doing and what you're launching? Because education is a big piece of what the collective is going to be. And what it is, it's, it's an organization designed specifically to work with independent music artists and industry professionals to help them learn and build viable, sustainable careers in this industry. Detroit doesn't have a hub or a source for anybody in the independent music community to go to for help. Sadly, Detroit, wow. a lot of, you know, the music community lives in silos. There's not a lot of collaboration. There's not a lot of community. You'll find pockets of it. But unlike some of the real big, other big music cities out there, be it Seattle, Nashville, Austin, Berlin, Montreal, Toronto, where they have a very vibrant music community and very 
a lot of collaboration to the point where they actually have city and state jobs that do nothing but focus on the music and entertainment community and help foster that, that kind of economic development and growth and put their arms around the community and try to work with them to become a major pillar industry within their city. We don't have that here. Not since Motown Records has there been any kind of epicenter. We felt, myself and a lot of other people at the De Detroit Institute of Music Education, we felt that that could be that opportunity but sadly it didn't happen and now that college is actually closed so there is a big hole for something like what we're about to be doing here wow that's a, that's a shame about the schools leading into my final question that actually asked from an education standpoint you know if you're talking with a student right now kevin who's thinking about getting into the music industry what kind of advice and guidance would you give him or her are they going to be an artist or are they looking if they're going to be an artist or if they're going to be going into the business side, you know, I'm, business side, knowledge is power and it's about networking. And this is a subject that's been dear to my heart lately because I've been talking to so many new industry professionals and artists and the, the, the skill set of networking just doesn't seem to be prevalent with a lot of people. And I don't know if it's because of the instant gratification and instantaneous of uh, social media where they don't think that they need to build relationships, but you know, it's about who you know in this industry, but more importantly, who knows you. And it's about learning from as many people as you possibly can. And especially people who've done it at a very high level. And that's what the Detroit Music Collective is gonna be about because not only myself, but you know, part of this team is Mike Jackery, who is the former senior vice president of marketing for the entire Universal Music Group. He has come back to Detroit and also he and his partners just opened up a, a new vinyl pressing plant here called 2424 Vinyl Pressing. He is part of my yeah. team, Michelle Terrell Elliott, who just re uh, retired from Universal Music Nashville after 17 years and also spent many years at Warner Brothers and Columbia Records. And then Scott Myrick, who, a brilliant venue owner here in town has worked with the independent music community has toured the world as as a tour manager has had a number of venues who so he understands live space us four came back together crazily that we hadn't talked to each other in a while and all of a sudden we came together and we were all on the same page about how do we start to give back what could we do differently we have all this experience that we've accumulated and we all at a point in our careers now where it's about wanting to give back and how to help other people in this industry build their careers. That's the basis of the Detroit Music Collective and how that was born. And this has been in only five months. And we sit here, you know, in a real exciting position. It's incredibly impressive, Kevin, what you've built and your career as a whole. And just for me, uh, you know, I spent about 20 years in the sports industry. I, I've got limited experience working in and around music. I learned something today. I also learned that the two industries are very similar, whether you speak about networking and it's all about who you know and building those relationships. It's very similar in, in sports, in entertainment, in innovation, all coming together in July in Las Vegas. Uh, really excited to have you. Proud and thrilled and honored to have you on stage moderating this, this panel, Kevin. And thank you so much for joining us today. I know our, our fans and our audience are going to be excited to, to watch this. So uh, looking forward to, to next week. We're going to be shooting episode number nine of Seacon Shorts. We've got a surprise host who will announce next week. But thank you very much for uh, for tuning in. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. And hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate your time.